I'm Leonard and I'm the co-founder of Clamplay. We're a messaging app for gamers. You can think about it like a very equipped uh, WhatsApp like, with lots of tools for uh, games. And we're now creating a, a marketplace for in-game actions where anyone can pay players for services inside games. We want to create value for gamer skills. Right? And so this panel is very interesting for me because uh, this is the first, I've been to many conferences before, and this is the first it, the intersection of games and crypto for myself, not for this esteemed people over here on stage with us who all have uh, distinctive experience in what they're doing. Um, and uh, let's start with you guys. So please introduce yourselves and we'll take it from there. Hello, my name is Marketa. I'm a marketing manager at Everdreamsoft and a project lead of BitCrystals, which is uh, Everdreamsoft uh, blockchain publishing arm, and so I'm in charge of uh, a few blockchain-based products and projects, as for example, a uh, digital wallet. Hi, uh, my name is Benny. I am the uh, co-founder of CryptoKitties, the world's first and biggest blockchain game. Uh, these cats have genetics, so you could breed the cats and everything's on the blockchain. Hi, my name is Sean Keith. I'm the vice president of BitGuild. We are a digital distribution platform for games built on the blockchain. Hi, uh, my name is Fazri Zubair. I am the CTO co-founder of Lucid Sight. Uh, we make blockchain games right now. Crypto Space Commanders are the game we're working on. Great. Thank you all. So um, for those of us who, do, who don't know the industry, we, we all um, are familiar with traditional fundraising methods. Now, say you want to create a game, a crypto game. Uh, so if this was a traditional game, you could get a publisher to fund your initial efforts. Uh, you could get a VC or an angel to invest in you. Uh, what would you say are the differences and similarities in being able to raise money uh, uh, for crypto games? Uh, well, actually, there are now publishers that are looking for uh, blockchain games. That's something that I learned recently. So you're, you're seeing more traditional kind of actors in the game space now getting into crypto games as well. So there's publishers. Uh, ourselves, we're a portal. Um, and we actually are willing to give out funding to some game projects as well if we think that they have merit. Um, and at the same time, there's the ability to do an ICO yourself if you're a crypto game company, which I wouldn't always necessarily recommend, but some companies do do it. They raise their own tokens for their game, um, and they make, you know, they can fund their game development through that ICO. Um, there's also uh, initial item sales, which I'll let Fazri talk a little bit more about, because that's what they did, or are doing. Uh, thanks, sir. Um, yeah, I, there's a lot of funding options with uh, crypto games. A uh, traditional publishing model, like you mentioned, is existing now. There are publishers looking and funding uh, games. But for us, with Crypto Space Commander, uh, we had this great idea for a game last year. Uh, we started putting docs together, and we started doing Medium posts about it, just to see what interest there was. And we had a huge community start to galvanize and form. So as we were developing the game, we wanted to let the players that were excited about it kind of enter early and then also figure out, like, how much money is this game going to bring in so we could figure out what the economy of the game shall be and how much we're going to develop into it. Uh, so we decided to go with an item sale approach where we were pre-selling items from the game. Um, and we actually sold one for 83 Ether. Uh, I think total, we had one player spend about $100,000 in items. It was a complete surprise, but it was great. Uh, and then he later came on into our Discord. He formed the first clan in the game. Uh, it's, it's pretty exciting to see the, the players kind of galvanize, but with this crypto space, I think there's definitely an appetite to kind of pay early before the game is developed and then see how it, it flushes out. Benny, you guys had a different approach, right? You uh, fully developed the game and then started selling the items, which are collectibles, uh, to players, right? Yeah, we, we kind of start off running a lot of genetic simulations uh, for the cats. We had the upper limit of about four billion variations. Um, and that was very important because we weren't too sure about the whole blockchain gaming. It was all of a, an experiment. Uh, we come from a startup background, so we have some gaming, but we mostly were building B2B SaaS. So um, I think that this brings a broader question of new business models that are enabled by blockchain games. And some of it could be like offering your items uh, for pre-sale, which a lot of blockchain games are doing, 
or kind of swapping in the virtual co currency that you have in existing games with crypto tokens and then have that as a way to uh, have people invest into your, into your game. Uh, but for us, yeah, we, we launched the game and we had um, this concept of different generations of caps and we have generation zero, uh, which we would auction off every 15 minutes. It just shows up in the marketplace. Uh, the other kind of business model that we have is that in our marketplace where people are buying and selling kitties, uh, we take a percentage cut, so 3.75%. So you could imagine that right now there's about, I think, 7, 7, or 770,000 cats in the marketplace. And people all over the world are buying, selling, trading, breeding, and then we just take a percentage cut of that. And some people may have questions of, where's the gameplay, right? Like this is like very, very basic, just buying, trading uh, cats. But um, yeah, I mean, we could talk more about it, but the concept of extensibility where there's like people who, like developers building kitty races, kitty hats, kitty battles, the gaming experiences come from uh, supercharged community and third-party developers. And the interesting thing is, the more that, p that people build on top of it, the more value the cats become. So there are new business models uh, besides ads or uh, heavy U UI campaign, UA campaigns that are unexplored. Uh, and, and one more point, uh, after you've, you've reached your initial success, you've proven that uh, you know, world-class VCs are interested in the space and, and you just secured a, a major investment recently, right? Yeah, we raised a, a Series A with our lead investors at Union Square and Andreessen Horowitz. Yeah. Way to go. Um, Marketa, um, so when we spoke yesterday towards the panel, you said that um, you guys did a, an interesting uh, approach. You took an interesting approach. So first of all, your ICO was... Uh, yes, it was in 2015. It's so a different decade, I think right, in crypto. Definitely. And, uh, and you, you sold not only tokens, but also collectibles, so items and tokens ahead of time, right? Uh, not really at the same time. E even before we started the ICO, uh, we started issuing uh, game collectibles, blockchain game collectibles, and we started selling them. Uh, so at that time, uh, the game didn't even exist. We... Uh, didn't issue uh, our currency, so we were selling those items for Bitcoin, and these were really selling very well. Um, and then a few months later, we came up with the ICO, so it was like uh, in 15th century, something like this. <laughs> um, and uh, we issued our own currency called BitCrystals, and we pre-sold this currency, so the classical ICO model. And even after the ICO, uh, we've still been keeping uh, selling the, the blockchain cards, the blockchain game items. Great. And everyone talking about the promise of uh, crypto games being that players are controlling their own items, right? They buy them from you, from the developers, but then they own them themselves. Now, it's always curious to me, why would I need an item from game A to use in a future uh, reference, but... Uh, you all have very different opinions about it, so uh, please share them. Yeah, I mean, this is something that we've seen uh, very interestingly in uh, Crypto Space Commander. Uh, one thing we've noticed in our communities, we'll have players come in that have been playing other dApp games, crypto bots, and they love the fact that they were able to go to a secondary market like OpenSea, sell their crypto bots to then buy a spaceship and play our game. Hmm. And I think that's one interesting aspect. If you go back to, like, old cartridge games, I'd sell my Nintendo game at GameStop, get something new. Now we're bringing that aspect to digital. So that's one way to look at it. Other is I think people just really like owning the items in a game. If you're going to spend 100 hours a month on EVE Online and you build up a Titan-class ship, you, you really don't want to lose that if the game closes down. Or you might want to do something with it once you're done playing EVE Online. I, I know I have a Titan sitting in my account for the last five years I haven't touched. It would be great to sell it to you, Okay, I'm not going to buy your Titan, but <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think one of the big issues right now is that players don't have the option to own the items, right? Uh, but if you give someone the option, uh, let's say you play World of Warcraft or something, you can either own your sword or the sword can exist within the game. You know, if you're a big gamer, that whole idea of, of owning the digital item that you hold so dear 
really strikes a, a really powerful chord. And so I think it's not necessarily a problem that exists, mm -hmm. but later as blockchain technology moves forward, there's more games that are tokenizing their assets. I think you'll, you'll slowly see appreciation of players towards that concept of owning their digital items that maybe doesn't exist right now. Um, at the same time, you know, we're still in the very infantile or the beginning stages of blockchain. And as more blockchain games come about, you know, something that we talk about sometimes in the industry is that you'll have interoperability of these, these assets. And you don't see this yet, well actually you kind of do with the Kittyverse, but being able to take your token, your, your asset, and taking it to different experiences, um, you know, moving it to different worlds. It's something that's existed within like the sci-fi realm for a long time, people have been interested in it. You saw Ready Player One, you know, it was, it was right there front and center. Um, and I think it, it's, it's really exciting to, to nerdy gamers like myself to be able to do that. And as the industry moves forward, that's gonna become more and more of a possibility. Um, and so I think, you know, there, there's two advantages right there that owning the item has. Yeah, uh, one uh, interesting thing about the true ownership of digital items, because we uh, recently ran a survey amongst our players, and it came out that they really appreciate uh, the fact they own their assets, at, and that's not only for their financial value, for the fact that they can resell them later, but there is something emotional as well. People really love to collect items, so this is something very important. And Marketa, you guys are taking an interesting approach where uh, not all items in the game are crypto, right? So uh, Bit Crystals um, is, is, is a game where you can have in-app purchases, virtual items, and then convert them into crypto assets. Yeah, so just the, the game is called Spells of Genesis. Oh, Bit yeah. Crystals Sorry. is, is the, uh, yeah, the whole ecosystem and right. the currency. So in Spells of Genesis, it's a trading card game with some um, arcade game aspects, and you can play this game uh, completely without knowing anything about blockchain, without touching a single blockchain item. Uh, there are, of course, in-app purchases, and as in any classical game. Then we have uh, some game items released directly on the blockchain, which are in the wallet, uh, which is owned by the player. Both applications can be linked, and uh, then the blockchain items can be used uh, inside the game. And there is the third option, that uh, in-game uh, assets, in our case these are cards, can be leveled up and uh, fused, and uh, at their maximum level, players can choose to keep them in-game as they are, or issue them uh, as a blockchain asset. Basically, we replace the in-game item by a token in the wallet, in the player's wallet. And so people can uh, somehow withdraw the in-game assets from the game and put them on the blockchain and use them, use them outside the game But as only well. if they got the item fully leveled up, right? Yes. All right, so you get them to grind first. It's That's like great. Yeah. another level, yeah. But, it, but I'm sure that once you've, I mean, the notion of having some extra level beyond the maximum level, which is when I can take the item out of the game, seems very interesting. Um, we spoke about financing, but let's talk a bit uh, about monetization. So Benny, you mentioned it earlier about uh, getting some of, uh, getting a percentage of all deals and then selling the items, right? The percentage of all transactions. I've also seen that uh, kitties are being traded on secondary marketplaces, right? Which is the decentralized nature of the game. Um, what do you see in the future of monetization for CryptoKitties? And then everyone, I'll, hap, I'll be happy to get your approaches on uh, where can this business model evolve to? Yeah, like as I was mentioning, there's a lot of unexplored space. Um, we, w we went to the most direct way, which is we're building a marketplace. So as with any marketplace, we take a cut. And we, the other angle that we have approached is using scarcity, right? So we have a lot of players. And we have these Generation Zero kitties, but uh, we also have different tiers of, of cats or kitties, right? We have fancy kitties and exclusive kitties. And about two weeks ago, we built an exclusive kitty specifically for a conference. It was the Ethereal Summit um, in New York City, and uh, we auctioned off this kitty. Uh, there was a Christie's auctioneer there, and it was about we sold it for $140,000 USD. And all of it went to uh, charity to help support artists. And so um, 
it's been interesting to kind of have scarcity as now a knob that you could turn off and on, uh, and you could prove it, right? If we were to create 10 of these special cats, there will only be 10, and you could check the distributed ledger. You could go to Etherscan and be like, okay, there's, there's 10 here. Uh, we can go into the back room and make a couple more. And so, uh, and you know, we, we couldn't say the same for centralized games, right, where Blizzard could be like, yeah, there's only one sort, and then maybe next year, oh, maybe there's one more sort. Uh, they could kind of do anything they want because the database uh, is under their under their control. So this is kind of the interesting things of like, there's new knobs now that you could turn on and off, uh, and you could work with platforms or even working directly with uh, exchanges. So for most people who are new to crypto, um, you have you have to buy crypto somehow. So either you buy it from a friend or you use a service that is consumer facing like Coinbase or you you could go to Kraken or Poloniex and create an account on the exchange. But for most consumers, it's kind of scary to take a picture of your passport and a selfie of your ID card, wait three weeks, and then kind of get verified and then send all your money to this site, and then you don't know what's going to happen. And if you were to think from that angle, uh, we've been talking to these exchanges and like, hey, if people are buying crypto from Kraken, what if there was just something right beside there? Hey, why don't you buy a kitty right beside there? So these types of partnerships uh, are new and no one has kind of done it before yet. And I think like there's many angles to take it, whether you're selling these assets in the current cryptocurrency exchanges or you're selling, uh, you're working with uh, exchanges inside of your, your game as well. So vice versa. It's a very uh, holistic uh, way to kind of approach it. So with monetization, you know, there's a lot, I think a lot of companies right now are focusing on selling assets, right? Especially the higher end assets in a game that will, you know, either whether it's maximum level cards um, or in other games like high level ships. Uh, but one thing, so I talk to a lot of developers because we're trying to get a lot of developers to put their games on our platform. And one of the first things I always ask developers is, you know, what is your strategy for the game economy? You know, yes, you can sell your game assets in the game economy, um, but that's going to fundamentally affect how the game economy plays out, especially down the road. So if you sell a lot of items in the beginning and those items are of stronger power, then you know, what about players? Come, they're going to be at a disadvantage later on, um, especially if they didn't pay in the beginning. And so the monetization strategies of selling items need to be thought out and game economies need to be designed in new ways. Um, that kind of we don't really see yet. Um, and that's really exciting for me um, as a gamer to see how developers are gonna innovate on these new game economies. Um, and you have to do it right. I think the classic case of Diablo 3, um, they had a marketplace where players could buy and sell in-game in items. Uh, but from what I've heard, they didn't do very well and they had to close it down eventually because players were not as incentivized to, to go out and grind like they had in the previous games and there was like an item scarcity issue and so, you know, I, I see pitfalls like that could potentially uh, exist for current developers also playing their games um, with tokenization of assets in mind. Do you think all crypto games will be pay to win? Uh, no, no, no. I think actually one of the things I'm excited for is eventually seeing the emergence of cosmetics being a big driver in spending um, in crypto games. And you can already see the, the demand for that in things like, you know, CSGO. People are buying and selling skins all the time, like OP skins. Uh, it has a huge marketplace, and they were one of the first ones to say we want to, you know, go crypto and and develop our own token and have our users use it. So I think cosmetics can be a big driver going forward. And then once, you know, maybe five, ten years down the line, if there is true interoperability of tokens between different games, um, the cosmetics can come into play again. You can say I can take my skin from, you know, game A. Maybe it's like a McDonald's skin even and I can take it to, to game B and I can still have a McDonald's looking character. Um, okay, maybe it's not the best example using McDonald's, but basically <laughs> cosmetics could be an interesting thing that we don't see yet that, that drives monetization going forward. Actually, this is a great question. I'm glad you brought up pay to win. Um, so when we were designing our game back uh, 
probably started in November, October last year. We had the concept of a pre-sale eventually, but we wanted to be very careful to avoid the pay-to-win scenario. So we've been very transparent with our user community, and uh, even when the way we laid out our statistics on the ships we sold, it wasn't pay-to-win. Uh, early adopters that are buying it have some nice advantages, like their ships will never be completely destroyed, they'll get them back. Uh, but a big key th uh, thing that we emphasized on was the stats in the game will adjust. Like any good game, when we are in our alpha period, when we're playing, we're going to have to balance it out to make sure it plays well. And that's the one thing. Um, I think you just have to be transparent with your development community uh, w while you're doing this. Uh, but to game economics, uh, how are we going to make money as a studio from this game? We've looked at a lot of avenues, and I think one big thing is engaging the users in the economics of the game. One reason we picked a space genre is because we can have a user economy where you focus on building lasers, you focus on building ships, you specialize and increase your crafting level on that aspect, and then you might become the best provider in the game. And and we feel that giving the users the ability to own the economy is going to generate transaction volume, which then we could collect transaction fees on. Also, we wanted to have a synergy between the player and the developer. So we said one of our main sources of revenue is going to be adding new content to the game. So when we add content, we provide the content as seed. So we will seed a new ship class. Maybe we'll sell 100 of them at a premium price. Players who then acquire them will then be the ones manufacturing them massively for the rest of the game universe. So um, like blueprints. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so th those are the, the economic vehicles that we're looking to use to continue and create a game that's going to last you know, a year, two years, ten years, hopefully. Uh, your game, Crypto Space uh, Commander, so it also involves mining, and there's a lot of uh, uh, places for players to interact, right? And do you see that economy evolving into paying for services, players uniting, creating... Uh, groups and coalitions and so on? Absolutely. Actually, it's already happened. We have been completely surprised at the engagement of our user community. Um, we launched a mini-game just to let early players start mapping out the universe. We created 50 star systems. Uh, they could send their ships out that they've pre-bought on like a, a, a kind of like an idle clicker style, send it, come back in 40 hours and see what it collected. And people started setting up websites where they're now decoding our algorithm and figuring out where all the core resources were in 48 hours, all the res rare resources were just completely gone out of 100 million we seeded. It was just ridiculous. Uh, but it's great to see this type of engagement. And I think one of my favorite stories about this was one of our players came on and said, his eight year old son would wake up every morning, go to Etherscan, paste his Ethereum address to see what they collected the night before. And we launched an event, uh, a wormhole event, which just accelerated the collection rate. And his eight-year-old son's exact words like, ah, upgrades. The next day <laughs> he goes in and he's just like, whoa, you got like 10 times as much in the night. Uh, but it's, it, it's definitely great to see like, there's engagement from like uh, the player is probably in his mid thirties, but his son is starting to see the value of like collecting these items, collecting those resources, actually having ownership. He wasn't using the game UI; he was going to EtherScan to see because that's like a third-party verification that that's something you actually own. Quickly chime in with one more thing. I think we're going to see different kind of gamers emerging too as blockchain technology goes forward. So we think of traditional gamers as gamers that participate in the game loops within the game. Yeah. Play Mario Kart, race a car, you know, play Smash Brothers, do a fighting thing. But with games now, you can actually have uh, speculators. So people that get in really early, they buy assets because they're hoping to flip the assets for a value. You have the financiers, so people that, like, let's say in the case of a space station, will buy the space station because they plan over a long period of time to recoup their, their, their spend because players will be using that asset. And you actually have the players that are using those assets, like in the case of a space station, um, you know, the players that are actually building things there or, or maybe selling stuff through the space station. So this kind of player participation in the economy hasn't existed before. Uh, but you can already see it happen in, in games like Crypto Space Commander um, and other games. Like F-Town, I think, is another example out there that has it. And I'm excited to see how game developers going forward will create these opportunities for not only traditional game players, but also for the speculators or for the financiers. Uh, to participate in the games as well. But you guys can take an active role because you're not only a platform, you're also developing games, right? Yeah, so we do have um, some internal development and, you know, talking to so many different game companies out there, we try to anticipate what kind of trends there are, what kind of, how do you say it, 
what kind of games the players are looking for right now. And if someone else is developing a game like that already, then maybe we'll stay away from it. But if we can identify underserved game genres or underserved game types out there, then yes, we might develop a game for that. Hopefully, and this is a uh, knock on wood, once we get enough game developers to put their games on our platform, and we have, we're going to try to build a repository of standardized game assets through all of our developers, right? So at the beginning, very simple, probably like 2D art. I own a ship that's represented by a 2D art piece. If we can standardize all of that, we can actually make game experiences that will reference all of our game develop partners, all of their assets within our game. Because the tokens will live in their, their wallets, and we'll be able to reference those tokens using a standardized library. I want to touch about what you said and ask you, Marquette, and then uh, lead this to everyone else. So we're speaking about platforms, and it's a, it's a good question on where do these games live, right? Are, can they live anywhere? Can they live on console? Can you create crypto console games? Can you create crypto mobile games? So your game lives on main mobile platforms, right? It's available on iOS and Android. How, how did you make that happen? Uh, yeah, so our, our game is a mobile game, and uh, actually it's kind of workaround because we don't have the, uh, you cannot purchase the blockchain assets directly in the game. As I explained before, it's a, it might be seen as a classical game with in-app purchases. Mm -hmm. So that's why it can uh, live on uh, App Store and, and, and Google Play, buys, and it's yeah. an additional option to adding blockchain assets in this game. So when players are buying your in-app purchase items, they pay Apple and Google, or you pay Apple and Google their cut, right? Yeah, yeah, it's keep, keep completely the classical way, yeah. yeah. And then how do you blend in crypto assets? So, um, as I explained, there's the game and there is a wallet. Mm -hmm. Because the blockchain assets are owned by you, not by the game, not by the, by the developers, by the game database. So you have your wallet, and you can uh, bind your wallet to your game account. And then every time you connect to the game, the game just looks into your wallet and uh, uses the assets which are in your wallet without taking them really from, from moving them from your wallet. You still have That's them. That's great. So you can display, um, uh, so you can display cri crypto assets even if they were acquired in different platforms. Yes, yes, definitely. <laughs> All right. What do the rest of you think about current platforms and future platforms uh, for the industry? Well, discoverability is a huge problem right now for blockchain games. Uh, we the the paved road for UA for traditional or mobile games is pretty clear cut, I guess. For us, we cannot run Facebook ads, we can't run Twitter ads, uh, we could barely run Google ads. So how do people find out about blockchain games? It's quite difficult. Um, fortunately for us, we've gotten a lot of press, but we look in as the industry in total, like how do, how do new players who want to play Crypto Space Commander or Eve Town, how do they find out? And it's really challenging. Um, fortunately, there are platforms like BitGuild and, and, and a bunch more that are popping up, and they're trying to be the, the, the center of finding these new game experiences. Not only that, um, Apple and Google, existing uh, great distribution platforms, there is that challenge of, um, you know, they can't take 30% of the assets, right? If I'm buying a $100,000 cat, there's no way that Apple's gonna take 30% of that, especially it's, if it's an Ether. Like, they don't have an Ethereum wallet, and if they did, like, how would they manage it? Right? They, don't, they don't have a strategy for it yet, but I'm sure they're working on it. Um, so everything that we're doing is very new, and there may be a rise of new distribution channels uh, that new blockchain games will have to pursue, uh, at least in the meantime until Apple and Google figure out a, a strategy to accommodate for blockchain games, and then platforms like BitGuild and a bunch of them that are being worked on uh, are going to be trying to consolidate all these uh, these games under one roof. So then a player could go there and then find a bunch of other games as well. Thanks, Benny. I can't say anything about it. Yeah, basically, BitGuild is, was working on this issue right now, and that is discoverability. There's, <clears throat> A, there's not a lot of blockchain gamers out there um, mm -hmm. in, in general. So, you know, it to get the ones that do exist to not only find your game, but to engage with your game and participate in the game, 
I think is a big challenge for a lot of blockchain game developers right now. <clears throat> and that's what we're trying to do at BitGuild, and we recognize that problem. These games need players, so let's build that user base, let's, let's foster that community, and become a place where they can go to find these games, to discover new experiences. Um, but, so, on the portal side, the platform side, that's what we're trying to do. But I think one of the other kind of uh, segments of your question is, what kind of games are being built, right? So not only, right now we see a lot of blockchain games being built on the, on the web, right? They're, they're very, usually relatively simple experiences. Um, but I see a lot more AAA developers starting to, you know, say, hey, we're gonna make a AAA game. Um, I know you guys out there are, are doing that. Um, but so we're, going forward, we're going to see more client-based games where blockchain um, like marketplaces and buying and selling assets is actually baked into the client itself. And so I see that as being an emerging trend. Um, and then again, mobile, there's a lot more companies interested in make, combining their mobile games with the blockchain. Uh, but I think it's, it's the solutions right now aren't very good necessarily for the user experience. You have to create a separate app, you have to send players between the game to that separate app, the wallet. And then there's the issue of having a mobile wallet. So uh, hopefully as we go forward, blockchain technology will progress in the way that the user experience will get a lot better, no matter if it's for a mobile game, you know, a PC client game, or even for a web game. Um, and so yeah, we're gonna see more than just the web games that exist right now. Uh, yeah, just to add to that uh, real quick, I'm a big believer that most of these games are gonna go client. Uh, just like early uh, iOS games were Java Web, then App Store came out, now you have native apps. And that's something along the lines we're working with CSC. We have a standalone Unity client, we'll have a mobile client that has built-in wallet tech. And we actually have a working prototype of an Unreal Ethereum wallet tech uh, for integration as well. But that, I think that's how you're gonna end up getting the mass users in. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna ask you this. You, you all talk about um, AAA games. What can the pro current protocols support now in terms of what can they do, what can they do, what are the you know, envelope uh, boundaries? Uh, and non-technical answer, please. Uh, well, I mean, th th there's lots of good technical responses to this one, but the boundaries mainly are the network speed. And I think uh, a big component of this is early games tried to use all blockchain all the time. And what we learned was from CryptoKitties crashing the Ethereum network slightly for a little while, um, is uh, we definitely have to look at this uh, a, a little bit more logically. Uh, you know, with Crypto Space Commander, 95% of our game does not happen on chain. Right. We use standard game tech, and that's how we're gonna achieve scalability. Uh, an average user might only need to interact with the chain once a week to synchronize, and that's all done back end through our servers. Uh, so that's, that's kind of an approach we're doing. So from that point of view, we feel like we can make almost any game, even on Ethereum as it is today, just by being intelligent about when we write to the blockchain and how we do it. So, kind of following that, the TPS transactions per second issue is a very big issue on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, if you want to buy something, it can take upwards of 10 minutes or even longer, uh, depending. Uh, but the flip side of that is also, you have to pay money to get your transactions confirmed. and so that kind of kills a lot of microtransaction based games. If you have a game with lots of small microtransactions and every time a player is buying something they have to pay $1.50, um, up to $1.50, uh, you know, uh, the players are not gonna be happy about that. And I've seen that actually already exist in some games where, uh, you know, players are encouraged to buy 50 cent items within the blockchain game or assets, only to end up being charged $1.50 on top of that. And so until that issue of transaction costs goes away or gets addressed, um, I think there will be some limitations as to what games can be designed. You can design your game any way you want to, but if you want to have good user experience, you can't have that 150 on top of like a very small microtransaction. Or maybe you can, I just haven't seen a good implementation of it yet. Yeah, we had a very interesting panel yesterday at the CryptoKitties meetup. It was, uh, we had EOS members and Ethereum and they had a, a great debate. It was all centered around content creators and, and gaming experiences. And you know, I think for all blockchain games that exist right now, we get to ask all the time, like scalability, what do you think? And 
for those who don't know, I mean, the blockchain right now is like dial-up internet, right? It's really slow, and there are platforms and games that are like the Neopets or AOL equivalent. So the UX is starting to improve, but same with the gameplay. Um, and our kind of sense is that it, it's it's going to get better right through time. Uh, it never stayed dial-up. Uh, it will go to broadband and, and, f and fiber internet. The one thing to note is that... Um, when you hear about scalability, um, typically, if someone's offering you like fiber internet when most of the most of the the chains right now are dial up, there's there's a trade off there that exists. And if they're extremely fast, there's probably something that they're trading off, and sometimes that's security. And if you ask yourself, like, in the long term, if we're thinking like 50 years, 100 years. The things that you are doing or the players are doing in these games when they're buying these things for a large amount of money is that they see it as an equivalent of a digital asset. So that's why, I mean, we're in a gaming conference and typically I think all of us also speak at crypto blockchain events and some of us also participate in, in art events as well. And it's this whole concept of what we're doing is creating digital assets. Uh, not in the same sense of, oh, this is a, a sword or, or just a gaming item. Uh, these digital assets could one day be what you pass down to your grandson, right? Uh, like that Rolex watch that you would pass down to your grandson, now you could pass down these digital assets that you bought in these games. Now, in order to achieve that, um, picking these chains that have a strong community, a strong brand, and strong technical uh, ability to handle these games in the near term, but also in the long term is important. Because what's worse is that if you paid for $100,000 for an in-game or this digital asset, that in maybe 20 years this chain shuts down or it forks or something really bad happens. Uh, everything that you've known that, that you thought had value uh, is not secure or maybe there's a really big hack that happens, right? So it's very important that uh, unlike building startups or games where it's iterative and you could release a patch, when you're designing a blockchain game, you're really focusing heavily on the economics but if you're creating smart contracts for these items, uh, these items you intend for it to live for many, many, many years, like hundreds or thousands of years. And for most of us, we can't think that far. We just think maybe till next year or six months. But uh, we want these kitties or we want all of our digital assets to outlive all of us and be able to pass down. So scalability is a problem. But make sure that when you're evaluating these trade-offs that uh, something that works fast now uh, may have issues later down the road. Yeah, just, I, I think really in, in general the, the current boundaries, the current issues won't be issues anymore maybe in a few months or a few years, but there will be new ones because the boundaries will move constantly. We are just in the beginning of discovering what can we do with blockchain currently, so it's really a living ecosystem. All right, so let's continue with this question about what uh, crypto games are, are holding in the future. So a year from now, two years from now, where do you think crypto games will evolve to? And then if you want, we can take uh, questions from the audience. Uh, that's really hard to say. Uh, what I think uh, will persist a year from now, two years from now, is going to be ownership and I think player involvement in the gaming economy. I think those are two things that are just fundamental to what's been introduced with blockchain. Um, how technology is going to evolve, where Ethereum is going to be, is there going to be a new blockchain at that point? Probably, uh, but we'll, we'll see. Yeah, there's, uh, I mean, it's really hard to say where it's going to be um, in like one or two years, but maybe in five to ten years, there's a couple things that I think have a lot of potential. One is user-generated content. With smart contracts, suddenly users can create their asset, put it up there, and you can actually kind of de-link game assets to game experiences. Again, as long as game experience creators um, can reference assets in a standardized way, there's nothing holding you back from just going up, creating an asset, like an art piece that you like, giving that art piece like a description, and then allowing players to buy that piece, that asset, and take it into a game experience that the game developer allows for. So that's one interesting element. The other one is, again, uh, item interoperability, taking your sword that you love into another game because the, that game developer uh, figures out a way to reference that sword in a standardized manner. 
So unlike AR uh, or VR games, um, I, I firmly believe that next year that this room would probably be quadrupled in size. There will be conferences dedicated to, there's already conferences dedicated to blockchain games uh, and publications that are popping up like Pocket Gamer having a really strong uh, publication directed to blockchain games. Uh, GDC this year, there was you know, a few blockchain games, few platforms there. I think there would be like a huge area that would be full of blockchain games. Uh, the reason being, unlike VR, AR, uh, there are strong economic and incentives that are built in or baked in with building blockchain games. Right now, a lot of people in the room are kind of sitting on two ends. One end being thinking about, man, I don't know how to, I don't know what blockchain is, and I think it's complicated, and I think building a blockchain game is extremely hard. The other people who are sitting in this room is, man, um, the UX experience of, from the user's perspective is extremely difficult. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that we'll be able to onboard our current players to a blockchain game. How would a wallet sitting in our game look like? Uh, and how would our users buy crypto? So I think that you know, people in this room are either sp split into these factions, but uh, in the coming year, those would be very, very clear because there'll be tools out there, there'll be platforms. Uh, we're pushing really hard on education and simplifying it because one thing that you know is if you ever attend a blockchain event uh, for Ethereum or any other chain, uh, they get really technical and that's great because they're building a protocol level, but for you know the, 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 the projects that are consumer facing and they want to kind of onboard the first billion consumers, uh, you really have to simplify it uh, and make it easy and accessible to play these experiences and engage with it because that's the most important part. Uh, so in a year there will be a lot of a lot more people here uh, building blockchain games because all of you would have uh, now Google search what is a blockchain game or what is Bitcoin uh, and then come back with uh, some ideas. Uh, the one thing you know for us is that we think that building a blockchain game, uh, the game part is actually what you guys are good at and it's quite difficult. Building the smart contracts is challenging, uh, but it's not the most difficult. For the people who don't know, uh, ICOs that have been happening in this space, uh, it's like 15 or like 20 lines of code to actually uh, create a token. So if you thought that ICOs were technically challenging, it's not. Uh, you just write 15 lines of code, you just rename what this token is called. You could call it the Benny token. And basically 99% of it is uh, marketing and hype community building. So that's what ICOs are doing when they were doing just writing a white paper and then they, they have a token and, and they're trying to sell it. Uh, so technically smart contracts, they can't be complicated. Uh, they're in bytes, right? So you can't put megabytes or gigabytes onto the blockchain currently. Uh, so building a blockchain game, I'm sure you'll figure it out. There will be tools out there. There's already platforms out there. Uh, but the UX experience is another field because right now there's like five tools or three tools you have to use. And every new user, we have to subject them to a 10-page manual of how to play this game. And uh, yeah, the 10 steps, and they all just like get out the door. So our biggest goal is to alleviate those pain points and work with the community to, to collectively make this UX super smooth so then everyone here who's a content creator next year would be easily uh, be able to build games and onboard new users. As Sean already mentioned, um, I really believe that user-generated content is the future of not only gaming but of uh, creation of, of digital, digital items. Um, because the current paradigm where uh, there were studios, big studios on one side who are producing and users consuming on the other side is currently changing thanks to the blockchain. And so one of uh, our goals with the, the project BitCrystals is to provide users with uh, tools helping them to access blockchain easily because as Benny said, it's still looks quite complicated, really technical, and people are a bit scared of it. So we are trying to, to build new type of wallets and so on to um, facilitate the access to the blockchain to normal, average, uh, classical users. 
we start off with one blockchain Solidity developer. We no longer actually have him on our team. I mean, he's working on new projects. But one thing to know is we have, when you're starting these projects, it was like three or no, like four or five engineers, full stack, front end, back end, and then one blockchain engineer. And then once they're done the smart contracts, the smart contracts is where you basically the items and the history of it all putting up to the blockchain. You don't really need that blockchain engineer. So if you think about it as a content creator perspective. Poor fate for them. What? <laughs> Poor fate oh, for them, yeah. yeah, yeah. They could they could help other people build games, and the one thing to notice, like, is when you're building smart contracts, you have to be very very careful. Uh, you've probably heard of these hacks and scams that happen in the space. If you start dealing with huge volume amount of like money coming into the game, uh, you can't cheap out on a smart contract because what's worse is that you build this really cool game. Like what if maybe there's going to be a big company like a AAA company that is rushing this process and writes a, has an error in the smart contract. Maybe we'll hear on uh, GameSpeed or Pocket Gamer that they got, like, they got hacked or something like that. It's probably going to happen in a year. But uh, building smart contract, you have to be very focused. They have to be perfect. Unlike like anything else that you're, you're building? Um, two things. One, <clears throat> there's a lot of, if you're interested in building games using blockchain technology, there's a lot of great groups out there that will help you like guide newbies through the process, support groups on Telegram and Discord. There's a lot of documentation. Smart contracts are all publicly available. Go to CryptoKitties, their smart contract, check it out. A lot of other companies already have. Um, <laughs> but uh, on the other side, I, I want to say that Right now we're saying blockchain games. And really it's games built using blockchain technology. And I think this is really important to, dis like, to, to, to mention because, because of the burdens of using blockchain right now for games, they feel it's, it's a blockchain game. You're like, oh, I have to go register for MetaMask and I gotta go buy an exchange, like all these things, 10 steps. Uh, so there's really like a unique experience involved with blockchain uh, with games. So they're blockchain games. Going forward as the technology, the underlying technology gets better and user experience is improved, it won't be blockchain games anymore. It'll be games that utilize blockchain technology. And I think that distinction is really important because really it's, it's one kind of technology, just like Unity, just like Unreal Engine, that game developers can use to, to make their game, to, to shape their economy. And so I think that paradigm is going to slowly shift as we move forward the next year to two years. Um, maybe. Crypto space commanders won't be crypto space commanders. It'll be space commanders with crypto. Just a little quick ad before we uh, wrap this. First, as a blockchain engineer, uh, you need us all the time. Please keep us hired. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, you know, we have three solid ones on our team, and even after they're done with the smart contracts, one thing we, we've looked at now that we've had the benefit of you guys launching first is, all right, well, if there is a problem, how are we going to migrate? And we're coming up with better migration solutions, and really the, the end result was uh, keep it extremely simple for your asset. You could create a sales contract. You could create a crafting contract separate from that, but that item contract that you need to persist for a 1,000 years, that should be a dozen, maybe 50 lines of code, very tight, very clean, um, and that's important because that can never change uh, if you want to keep uh, the asset consistent. Uh, but just wanted to add that. So, uh, I'm totally into doing also doggy, uh, similar to Sean's a big build platform to host it, nothing but crypto games. Um, anyway, so coming up to the conversion rate of the users, because marketing and distribution is extremely important to get this market uh, to work. Um, there will be two points of huge drop-off rate when you convert the gamers to play the crypto kind of centric games. One is when you open, they, they have to open the wallet. The other one that I see, and then, you know, like all you said, the technology will evolve to solve that problem. The other one is, and I think it was mentioned a little bit, the network speed, when you do microtransactions or Let's say in, if you play a more complex the game, that you have to do the IMP, then if it takes longer, that will be drop off rate, right? People want to, you know, get the weapon and kill somebody else, and and then the transaction <laughs> to buy that weapon is going to take anywhere two to five uh, minutes. So how do you? And then you know that's obviously a big drop off rate. How do you handle that kind of obstacle? This is actually a great question, something we've been tackling in our game design uh, from the start with Crypto Space Commander. And it all has to do with 
do you need that transaction to finish to show the user the next step? So if you initiate a transaction like crafting, well, while they're crafting, they could be going out mining rocks, they could be blasting pirates, they could be doing a lot of different things. And it really comes to how you construct your game and put in logical moments of waiting that the user doesn't get blocked on. They could continue and do something else with. Yeah, I think right now, most games are built using Ethereum or the Ethereum chain. And you have to design your game with the limitations of Ethereum in mind. And that it's, it's just a reality. If you don't, then you're going to get caught up um, in the limitations and the user experience is going to be poor. But going forward, as we've said, hopefully technology will move forward. Transaction speed will go up, costs will go down, and then that will open up the avenue to do more, more things within the game on the chain. Um, do you guys see equivalents of uh, item uh, tokens in other uh, protocols? So the equivalence of ERC-721, which you guys call non-fungible, but people might easily understand them as distinctive uh, tokens. Do you see them in other protocols already? Not really. <laughs> I think, like, I mean, EOS is going to launch to mainnet, uh, I think, Friday or tomorrow or on Saturday. So a lot of chains are in the stages of... Um, pre test net so they're just like theoretical white paper they're touting you know how fast they are and then you have some that are in, most are in test net like the the legit ones and then you have ones that are transitioning to main net right uh, but really it's bitcoin and ethereum that are on the main net uh, but with ethereum they're smart contracts so the non-fungible aspect right now is just really sitting in ethereum um, from what we could see um, but I'm sure that all the other chains now are like, hey, we should also include this, bake it in into the protocol. And today is the mainnet launch of, of the Tron blockchain, which gives all the advantages. And he's very modest, Sean. He, this guy has to offer a platform to like 100 million users already that are game interested in this blockchain. I mean, uh, you're too modest, I would say. You, you have a lot to offer for game developers. So the Tron blockchain that is launching today has a lot to offer for the games industry, I believe. So forget about Ethereum and go for uh, the, 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 the gaming dedicated blockchain that is, of course, uh, very efficient and you can make microtransactions for like zero costs. Please answer the question. <laughs> yeah. um, so so uh, Justin Sun, the, the founder of, of Tron, is one of our advisors um, and we do talk to them closely. I, I mean, I think it's, it's important for everyone in the space uh, it behooves you to, to follow the developments of all the chains, you know, Tron, EOS, Hashgraph, Loom, every, not only chains, but like sidechain projects or, or uh, technology that builds on primary chains. Uh, because really, there is a lot of talk out there right now. So many people are talking about, you know, oh, we're going to have hundreds of thousands of transactions per second at zero cost. Um, but we don't actually know what the, the silver bullet's going to be yet. Um, and there's probably space out there for multiple main chains to exist for different functions, right? Entertainment, finance. Uh, and so we're, you know, at BitGuild, we're following closely the development of all this technology so that eventually not only can we uh, provide our user base with a better experience using better technology, but also we can work with our developers, the developers that we're partnering with, and encourage them to adopt uh, newer and better technology that will lead to better player experiences as well. Thank you very much, everyone. It was a great panel.